Okay? So Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for tonight, for the opportunity to uh, be with you, to read your word. God, we know that this word is living and powerful. It's active. And God, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Any two-edged sword that's a physical sword. God, we know that your word is more powerful than that. And God, we ask that your word would do its work tonight in our hearts, in our lives. We ask that you bless uh, this time that we have together and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, If you could, can you turn up the lights a little bit in the room so that they can take notes if they'd like? (coughs) It doesn't have to be like massive, but that's good. Um, Okay, so I'm going to read... Um, I always say it's going to be short, but I really believe with my whole heart that this one's going to be super short, all right? So, uh, last week we talked about Philippians chapter 2, the main verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, okay, it says this, that this attitude is supposed to be in you that was in Christ. And we talked about having an attitude like Jesus, okay? And what we're going to talk about today is the next part of this in Paul's letter we're going to talk about, we're going to see examples of people being in, having the attitude of Christ. Because how many of you guys are planning on uh, picking up a, an actual cross and walking down a long road after you've been beaten? Uh, how many of you guys think that's God's plan for your life? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody in here thinks that that's their, God's plan for your life and to be crucified on a cross? Okay, that's, that's correct, okay? So, well, I mean, maybe... That, that'll be what you're called to do, but not likely. So what, what Paul does here is, is after he talks about Jesus and he tells us to follow his example, he gives us an example in, in two men. Well, number one, he gives it in himself, but then there's two men that Paul's going to talk about in here that we can follow their example. Because, you know, Jesus is our example. We are to, to live like him, but how do we practically do what Jesus did? Like Jesus came to earth specifically to die on a cross. He knew that was God's plan. He saw it in the scriptures. But for us, what does that look like? Like, have you guys heard God's voice? Like, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you are supposed to live like Jesus. Has anybody heard God's voice telling them, like, specifically what you're supposed to do? So, what we're going to read tonight, I hope, will encourage you that... Uh, you, you can take practical steps in being like Jesus, okay? And we're going we're gonna to learn about two guys, and I want you guys to remember their names if you can, okay? So let's read in verse 19. If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. So Paul looks and he he says to the Philippians, look, I care about you guys. And there's only one other guy that I know that cares about you this much. And I hope to send him soon to you so he can show you the love of Christ that I want to show you if it weren't for my, you know, being in prison. Because Paul's writing this letter from prison to the Philippians, a church that he helped start. So, he says, I hope that, um, that, that he'll come to you. I hope that I'll be able to send him. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. Paul's like, hey, you guys know who Timothy is. I brought Timothy along with me on the journey. Okay, you guys hung out with Timothy. You saw that he was my right-hand man, that I was the father, his father in faith, you know, and that he's taken after me. You know, I'm kind of passing the, uh, the, the baton to him now. So he's like, I hope to send Timothy to you. He's a guy who really loves you and cares about you. He was with you at the beginning, just like I was. Guys, I know you love me, but, you know, Timothy's a, a great man. I hope to send him so he can show you guys. And he says this, I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. Paul's like, listen, I'm in jail. I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to keep Timothy around. But once I figure it out, I'm going to send him. 
and I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. So he's like, but don't worry, guys. I, I'm hoping to see you. So he talks about Timothy. Okay, Timothy was, like I said, a son in the faith to Paul, a uh, protege, I guess. He was, he was the understudy of Paul to take the reins after Paul died. And Paul would write later to Timothy in First and Second Timothy, letters that he wrote to, to him at the end of Paul's life, telling him to run the race. You know, Timothy was, uh, they call him Timid Tim. It's really, it's really easy. Tim, Tim, Timid Tim. Timid means to be shy. Timothy was shy. Actually, one of my favorite verses is in 1 Timothy 4.12. And, and this is what Paul says, because Timothy was young. How many of you guys are young in here? How many, how many would you consider yourself young? Okay, whenever I was uh, your age, and even now, whenever I'm my age, I get a little shy, I get a little timid. <clears throat> like, I feel like God's telling me to do something, and I don't do it sometimes because I get a little scared. But look, Timothy was timid as well. And Paul told Timothy at the end of his life, he said, Timothy, don't be timid. Don't be scared. But preach the gospel. And the, the things that I taught you to do, do it. So Timothy was Paul's understudy, and Timothy was going into churches and, and being the pastor of churches and, and leading people to Jesus and to the gospel, and, and lives were being changed through Timothy. So let's think about Timothy. In your small groups tonight, bring up Timothy. Talk about him. Okay, uh, maybe in your small groups, talk about uh, who Timothy was, if you know anything about Timothy that maybe I'm not saying, but speak about Timothy and and, and look for examples and, and how you can be like Timothy in the faith and in your calling, whatever that is. <clears throat> okay? So, in verse 25, he says this, Meanwhile, I thought I should send, you ready? This is a tough name, Epaphroditus back to you. So, since I couldn't send Timothy my man, my, my main man in the faith, I'm sending back Epaphroditus. Now let me tell you guys a little something about Epaphroditus that we're going to find out a little bit uh, right here. But whenever the Philippians heard that Paul was in jail, remember the, the first teaching I taught on? How they, you know, how they were you know, being told that you know, Paul was like not a real apostle any longer and that uh, they were starting to doubt his apostleship and that he was really walking with the Lord. And Paul's like, no, 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 guys. I am walking with the Lord, okay? And even though this situation looks bad and I'm in jail and God hasn't broken me out, you know, I'm still trusting in God and God's still doing amazing things. Well, the Philippians heard that Paul was in jail, so the Philippians' heart went out to Paul. And they sent a guy named Epaphroditus. That's right. So Epaphroditus is from the Philippian church. He goes to Paul to comfort him in his chains. I think uh, he even brings a, a money gift to Paul. Like, hey, hey man, here's some help from us, from the Philippians. I hope, you know, this is what we got. This is what we all gathered together. We love you, Paul, and we're trying to hook you up, brother. Listen, meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. So Paul said, man, I was in need. And you guys sent Epaphroditus. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. So he's homesick. And he is very distressed that you heard he was ill. Okay, wait. That's, that's a little new to us in this passage. Okay, so Epaphroditus went to Paul. I don't know what happened, but maybe during his travels, uh, he got very ill, very sick. And Paul says this, that he didn't want the Philippians to know that, that he was sick because he didn't want to worry them. You know, worry upon worry. They're already worried about Paul. And Epaphroditus is sick. And listen to this. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. Epaphroditus takes the gift and he almost dies doing that. Like traveling back in the day wasn't just getting into your car and driving, you know, thousands of miles. Uh, me, Brandon, and Sean went to a, 
a trip uh, for a trip in, in Missouri and we led worship there. Okay, that wasn't as difficult as, as this travel was. It took us like 14 hours, I think. Uh, well, with them and their pee breaks, Sean specifically, it took us like 15 or 16. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, and you know, Brandon almost getting us killed on the road. Okay, I, we can talk about that later. Look, they're both horrible drivers. Hey, look out for Sean, by the way, because he is driving a stick shift right now, and he's learning how to drive that thing, okay? All right, so it goes like this. So Epaphroditus certainly was ill because he traveled so long. Okay, and he got ill, he got sick, and it says this. In fact, he almost died. So Epaphroditus almost gave up his life to go, he went out of his way to show love and hospitality and care for Paul. Are you guys, you guys, you guys hear me? You, hear what, you remember what I said at the beginning? Okay, many of us will not probably be in the situation where we're gonna have to die for the sins of the world and we're gonna be going on a Roman cross. You know, that was Jesus dying and showing us what we were supposed to do. And that was him paving the way for us. But now we see Paul, who is going out and sharing the gospel, and he is looking to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of his faith. He's got his eyes fixed on Jesus, and now what he is doing is he is dying to himself and sharing the gospel, and whatever happens to him, he's like, whatever comes, let it come. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. No matter what circumstance I'm in, I'm going to die to myself and I'm going to serve other people. So we see in Paul an example of Paul following Jesus in that way. And then we see Timothy, little Timothy. Timothy lived in the city of Lystra, I think. Uh, it's like Lystra, Derby, And he lived with his grandmother and his mother. I'm sure he's pretty comfortable. Well, Paul comes in one time, and all the believers in that city, they're like, hey, man, there's this kid. His name's Timothy. He's awesome. And Paul's like, okay. He, he talks to Timothy. He sees the faith of Timothy, and, he, and he's like, hey, man, you should come with me. Timothy up and leaves his comfortable home with his grandma and his mother, and he goes on missionary journeys with Paul. And now we see Timothy traveling one place to another, in difficult circumstances, Timothy died to himself to serve others. He left the, the comfortableness of his home and he went and followed Jesus. He kept his eyes on Jesus and followed Paul and served others. That was a way that Timothy died to himself and followed the example of his dying savior, Jesus. Now we look at Epaphroditus all of these guys' stories are different. But now we look at Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus is from the Church of Philippians. You know, he's like a little, probably nobody. You know, no one's ever heard of this guy. You know, he hasn't written any letters like Paul. He doesn't have 13 epistles in the Bible. You guys probably never even heard of Epaphroditus before tonight. But a little nobody ups and goes all the way to Paul in his distress, almost dies to show hospitality to Paul, to show love to a brother. By the way, did you guys listen to all the wording in this? Paul calls Timothy his son. Paul calls Epaphroditus his brother. There should be in this place love, like a family. We should be looking out for each other. We should be having each other's backs. We should be willing to do the same thing that Timothy did, that Epaphroditus did, laying down my rights to serve others. And because we do this, guys, it should translate into the gospel going forth into people's lives. The gospel is the good news, by the way. I keep on using that word. Maybe you guys don't know what that is. The gospel, it means the good news. It's basically telling people that Jesus Christ died for their sins and that he's come so that they could have life and be saved. That if they turn from their wicked ways, they turn to Jesus, they'll be saved through faith. It's not of works, it's a gift. So what I'm telling you guys is this, we should be a family in here. 
We shouldn't be bickering and fighting. Yes, we can have disagreements. We can have fights and arguments. All right, but quickly examine yourself and see if you are causing division. See if you are a person who is sowing seeds of discord, dissonance, of, of, of just wreck, if you're just wrecking things. See if you're that person or examine yourself and see if you're a person who brings people along with you, who is hospitable, who is loving and kind. Examine yourself. Paul is using family terms here to describe people who aren't even related to him. You know why they're family? Because we're all children of God once we come into uh, into, into faith in, in Jesus Christ. Whenever we fall on our knees and say, God, forgive me of my sin, God makes us his children. And he brings us into family. And now, guys, no matter what difference you have, skin color, um, sex, nationality, anything, whatever differences you have, like, oh, man, I don't have the same hobbies as this person over here, it doesn't matter. Because there's commonality in Jesus Christ. And now we have each other's backs. And we should be loving one another, not tearing one another apart with our words, not tearing one another apart with our actions. But we should be like Epaphroditus, willing to die, to go out of our way to serve one another. This is what Epaphroditus did to follow in the steps of Jesus. This is what Timothy did to follow in the steps of Jesus. This is what Paul did to follow in the steps of Jesus. Here's the end. But God had mercy. So Epaphroditus almost died. And in verse 27 it says this, God had mercy on him and also on me. Paul's like, this is my boy. This is my, this is my dog, man. He's true, man. Also on me, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. All the way to the end, here it goes, uh, till chapter 3, that is. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him. And, when I, oh, and then I will not be so worried about you. Paul is in another city worrying about people hundreds of miles away. Do you, guys, do you guys hear what I'm saying? Examine yourselves. Do you care about the person who's sitting next to you? Guys, we're a family. We were created in Jesus Christ for good works, to love one another. Do you care about the person next to you? Now think about this. Here's, here's one that's going to hurt. You ready? Okay, you're lovey-dovey, all up on your friend. You know, that's cool. But imagine the person that makes you the angriest in this room. Imagine the person that you're like, I don't want to hang out with that person. That person absolutely bugs the crap out of me. No, I'm serious. I, he, he, he bugs me. Okay? Or she bugs me. I can't stand her. Guys, do you care about that person? Even though they get under your skin, do you love them? Are you willing to die to yourself? Guys, I have to have a heart check a lot of times with the person that lives with me. Like, that dude bugs me, man. He's the worst dude. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. He actually probably has more of a heart check than me. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Okay. So, just think about that. Loving one another. We're family. This is what I'm trying to push at you. And this is what the Bible is pushing. To live as Christ lived. Serving other people. <clears throat> Welcome him with Christian love. Okay, I know that sounds kind of fluffy. Welcome him with Christian love. Oh, here's some Christian love. But what the love that he's talking about is this. We love 
because God loved us. Okay, before we came to Jesus Christ, we never knew of this love. This love that dies for somebody else, that has someone else's interests in thought, in mind. Guys, that's a love that we, we never knew. But now because Jesus Christ showed us that love and has transformed our lives and hearts, we can love with that unconditional love. Unconditional love, are you ready? This is unconditional love. Jesus, okay, God knows everything that you're going to do, everything that you did, everything that you're gonna do, all the bad things you're gonna do, and guess what? He looks at you and he says, I love that person. Okay, we don't have that kind of knowledge, but no matter what kind of wrong I have done to God, in my life, no matter how many times I've cursed his name, no matter how many times I've disobeyed him, I, I have loved other things more than I loved him, even though I you know, came to God and I'm like, God, you're my number one, you're the only thing I want. Like the next day I'm like, okay, oh, I love video games, man. I'm, even though so many times I've done that to God, God looks at me and he's like, I love you. Unconditionally, no matter what stupid crap you do, I love you. Guys, that's the love that we need to welcome others with. No matter what kind of crap they do to you, you love them. Christian love, agape, unconditional love from God. We, it's a love we can't have unless God gives it to us. And what I would encourage you guys to do is pray for that love, because God will grant that to you. God will give that to you. All right, I'm almost finished. Here it is and with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve. Paul's like, this dude is outstanding. Give him honor. Appreciate him. Guys, look around. Look at people who you see serving. Maybe even your parents. Or maybe somebody who maybe bugs you a little bit, but they're like serving you and they love you. Look for those people and go over and appreciate them. My man John right there, doing sparkle every week, rocking it out. Go up to that dude and say, thanks, man. Thanks for being a servant. Man, you're not in the limelight. You know, you're not, you're not up on stage all the time, but thank you for serving. Sean, thank you so much for coming up and setting up and, and, and hooking us up, for loving us so much. Like, I don't know if I appreciate you enough. Thank you. I love you. You're the man. Okay? Neil. Thank you so much, man, for being here every stinking week, man. You don't stop. Go to these people. Go to your friends. Go to somebody who's serving. Hey, Max. Max, thanks for being, being here all the time, man, jumping up and down, being in excitement. Dude, you make 180 rock, man. You know? Like... I appreciate. By by the end of this, uh, by the end of this teaching, by the way, we're all gonna sit in a circle around a campfire and sing Kumbaya. So, I don't know if you guys are ready for that or not. <clears throat> and we're all gonna stand up and tell people how much we love them. Okay, for okay, this is what it says. Show him the honor he deserves, guys. Begin to stop looking at yourself and being like, oh, well, people owe me a thank you. I came and did this, okay? They owe me this. Okay, instead of doing that, go like this. I'm a loser. You, thank you so much for what you have done. Be an encouragement. Be loving. Start to get your eyes off of you and on others and begin to encourage people in their giftings. And I promise you, this place, well, man, this place, this place already rocks. And as you guys begin to die to yourself more, this place is going to be even more awesome. And God's going to use you guys to reach your friends, your family, and, and this community. For he risked his life, Epaphroditus did, for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you could not do from far away. There we see it. This is the end. We are to have this mind in us that Christ had who saw the cross, saw all the shame that came with it, and he still chose to love you. 
Let that love permeate in your heart. Let God come into your life and help you love like that. I promise when you do that, like we talked about, oh, I think two weeks ago or a week ago, when you begin to do that, you'll begin to have joy. I'm not, I'm talking about like deep down joy, like contentment, like man, nothing can, nothing can crush me right now, like Paul had, like Jesus had. You, God will give you that if you come to him and ask him for that. If we begin to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto others, onto Jesus Christ, we'll begin to love like he loved. And that's what I want for you guys. That's what I want for myself.